He is old school Soviet. Today, Putin wraps himself in an ideology of white Christian nationality, nationalism. He has cracked down on ethnic and religious minorities. He has persecuted the gay and lesbian community. Hold on a second. Let me put this into a quick perspective for anybody out there who doesn't already know. Ben Cardin, a front runner for the pro-trans homosexual Democratic Party, also had one of his staff members who was fired for putting this video out that he made in the Capitol building of the United States. In the Senate hearing room, this is what they do there in the United States Capitol building. Today, Putin wraps himself in an ideology of white Christian nationalism. He has cracked down on ethnic and religious minorities. He has persecuted the gay and lesbian community. He is the one telling you that white Christian nationalism is bad. This is how they act. So you tell me. Africa seems to be embracing the white Christian nationalist of Vladimir Putin. And if America can get African Americans to believe it, then the Black Lives Matter can change their names to Black Votes Matter. If you haven't noticed that Africa is kicking out the United States military out of many of their countries over the past three years and has made room for Russia and Vladimir Putin to bring in their military, then you've been either censored by your algorithm or on a desert island. And you're probably being censored by your algorithm. Maybe not. If Africa, which is predominantly black from which I've heard, if they are choosing Vladimir Putin and his army over the armies of America in the West, then wouldn't you think that Africa would probably be the ones to ask why? Or would you rather get this information from the United States government and the far left wing media outlets that are in the pockets of the Biden regime of the story writers and producers and bureaucratic minions? Personally, I'll go to Africa and get it from the Africans myself. Who do you trust more on black society? Far left American liberal Democrats or black society. Now, if you want the in-depth look on Christian nationalism, if you want to know what it is, first off, it's neither white nor black nor dependent on your skin tone. If you want to know everything about it in order to have an intellectual discussion or dispel any false narratives about it, you know, kind of like thinking for yourself and he, because you've heard it straight from the horse's mouth, remember this, that woe to them in that day who call evil good and good evil. So let's find out the difference before we do that. Like, like and subscribe, click that notification button so when I get information out, you can get information in. And now we're going to watch that Ben Cardin reel that I showed in the beginning of the video, who is a state senator for the Maryland, Washington, D.C., and what he had to say about Vladimir Putin. But since his rise to power at the turn of the century, Putin has turned Russia in a very different direction. Rolling with regimes as repressive and corrupt as anything under Brezhnev or Khrushchev. He is old school Soviet. Today, Putin wraps himself in an ideology of white Christian nationality, nationalism. He has cracked down on ethnic and religious minorities. He has persecuted the gay and lesbian community. He has shut down independent media and jailed journalists. And as anybody with a brain or anybody who questions things more than once can tell, He's trying to weaponize the government with the mindset that Vladimir Putin is a white Christian nationalist. So that's kind of part of the anti-Russia, a reason to combat Africa thing that they're pushing right now. You see it. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Please like, subscribe, click that notification button so when I get information out, you can get information in. I would love to just say I want to thank everybody who's watching. We appreciate your comments below, and we are just so thankful to have you as part of our family here. I do believe that those of you who watch the Speak and See, the Speak and See show are probably some of the smartest and in-depth, uh, intelligent people in the world that, that, that have more information than people who just watched that 30 second TikTok video and think they know everything. Um, so what, what I'm going to show you today is the Christian nationalism is the target for the one world order in the one world government to, to take over and become God become, try to become God so that you don't worship a God, you worship the government. And that's what we're seeing here with it, what they're trying to start to call um, Christian nationalism. And some people say white Christian nationalism Black, it, it doesn't matter what color you are. Christian nationalism is not a color. We can see that very, very closely with Africa, except in Russian, Russia uh, right now as, as a great friend and Putin as a great ally because, well, they have more in common. And I, I don't believe at all that, that Putin is a white 
supremacist or anything like that at all. Uh, but those are just my views. You let me know what you think down below. But here we're going to dive into it because when we hear that phrase, Tucker Carlson had on a pastor, Doug Williams, who is, sure, he calls himself a Christian nationalist. And we he explains in depth what that is, because if you don't know what it is, you really can't condone or justify it or condemn it if you don't know what it is. Uh, just uh, off this, you know, people regurgitating whatever they want. They're flossy nasi in the hill pil pilification of life in general when it means absolutely nothing what they're saying because you don't know what they're saying. Um, and they take it out of context. So with this, I would just like to ask that you all comment below because I honestly didn't see this being a far, a bad thing. And it kind of made sense to me. Um, so let me know what you think as we watch this interview. This was like a, a one and a half, two hour interview. I've cut it way down because everything that we learn, all this knowledge that we're taking in is useful information. And when we see other governments and countries or entities attacking certain areas of life and freedoms, it's nice to know exactly what they're doing and not just catchphrases that they're using, but what they're actually doing and what's involved in what they're doing. Because they're going to be trying to do this, and they are doing it in Africa, home of 1.4 billion people. 1.4 billion people. And I would like to think that probably 95% of them are black. So if they're going to use this against Africa, I don't think it's a white thing. I think that it's a God thing. It's about Jesus. And they're attacking, attacking our faith and the world's faith right now. And they're trying to put government in place. Check this out, please. Like, subscribe, watch. You got to watch this to the end. Grab yourself a drink because there's a lot of information in here that will definitely benefit you in the future as you start seeing things come start to evolve in the media and in the news and what's going on around the globe as far as war, wars, stock markets, everything is involved with this type of Christian hate. And, and you may see this as an anti-Christian, anti-Christ-like mind that the government has that's coming uh, to try to control everything in life. So let's take a look, grab yourselves a drink, and thanks for watching. So if you're Joe Biden standing for re-election at the age of 81, the obvious question is, what exactly are you going to run on? You're not going to run on the state of the economy. You're not going to run on the state of the world, which is increasingly chaotic. You're not going to run on lengthening life expectancy because actually life expectancy is declining in the United States under his watch. So what are you going to run on? What well, you're going to run against. And the main thing Biden is going to run against is Christianity, running against Christianity. He's already put people in prison for praying, so it's not a stretch. But of course, you're not going to say I'm running against Christianity, the world's largest religion. You're going to say I'm running against something called Christian nationalism, which was a way of making traditional Christianity seem like a threat to the country rather than the principle upon which it was founded. So that is their plan. They can run against something called Christian nationalism. And in this, they have the full cooperation of Hollywood and the media outlets, which are whipping up the population to a frenzy over this threat called Christian nationalism. Well, most of us, even those of us who pay some attention, aren't really sure what Christian nationalism is. Is it a product of what it sounds like, which is some branding meeting in the basement of the DNC designed to make Christians seem really scary if they believe in God? Maybe. We decided we would ask the person most closely identified with that phrase, Christian nationalism. He's one of the rare American Christian pastors who is willing to engage on questions of culture and politics. And for that, he has taken a lot of grief, but we are honored to have him. His name is Doug Wilson. He's the pastor at Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho. So I'm sincerely confused by the phrase Christian nationalism, which seems like an attack on Christianity to me. What is it to the extent you understand it? And are you a Christian nationalist? So I'm willing to be a Christian nationalist because I, <laughs> okay. because I prefer that phrase to the phrase I usually get called. So, what do you uh, get? What do you usually get? Oh, called? white supremacist, you know, white supremacist, slave advocate, oh, uh, uh, you know, racist, uh, you know, all the theo fascist, Christo. So the 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 left really does hate Christianity. Yes, and uh, with the phrase Christian nationalism, even the part of it that's coming from the left trying to wrap that around our necks, that's something I think I can explain. I, yeah, I can say, yeah, yes, but, and then explain in two, inside of two minutes. I, but may I ask before you, and thank you for doing that, and I will listen raptly because I really want to know. But just to clarify the terms, is that a phrase that you or people with your beliefs came up with, or was that a phrase that was 
leveled against you? Well, b- both. Canon, Canon Press uh, published The Case for Christian Nationalism by Stephen Wolf. So okay. that was our embrace of the term. Okay, and Stephen Wolf um, wrote a defense, a scholarly defense of the whole thing, the history of the whole thing. Uh, so we embraced it to that extent. But then on MSNBC just a few weeks ago, um, uh, there was one of the talking heads there that said, anybody who believes that rights come from God and not from Congress and not from the Supreme Court is a Christian nationalist. All right. But this is something that people can say, oh, I love my nation and I'm a Christian. Why can't these? Well, that's how I feel about it. Right. I, I don't know what it is. So how would you define it? So um, it's, I think, very simple. If there is no God above the society, if there is no God above the state, take God away. Yes. The state is God. Yes. Okay. If there is no God above the state, the state is God. The state becomes God. And it assumes the prerogatives of deity, Tra- you know, cameras at every intersection, aping omniscience, yes. uh, omnipresence, uh, in big bro- brothers watching you. Control uh, of your mind. Control of your mind. They want to control absolutely everything. Every keystroke, they want to control everything because they're aspiring to deity. The reason they're aspiring to deity is because they don't recognize any God above them. Okay, now, this is where everybody, I think I'd be with, uh, most people would be with me up to that point. All conservative believing Christians. Would the believe. state is not God. The state is not God. Yes. Okay, and the early Christians were persecuted, not because they worshiped Jesus, but because they would not worship Caesar. All right, the whole issue of Christians being thrown to the lions had to do with who they wouldn't worship, not who they would. Right. Okay, the Romans were more than happy to add Jesus to the pantheon. Yes, exactly. Okay, but the claims of Christ are exclusive, and Christians would not uh, recognize Caesar as Lord. Jesus is Lord is the fundamental Christian confession. So most Christians are with me right up to that point. But then the immediate comeback question from our antagonists would be, okay, if you want to have a God above the state, which God? Okay, and that lands you right in the middle of theological debate, which is the last place in the world a lot of people want to be. For sure. Okay. Is it Allah? Is it Shiva, the God of dest- destruction? Is it uh, the Unitarian God? Is it the Christian God? What do you, you know? What God is it? Is it the Satan of the Church of Satan? Right. And uh, incidentally, if I could put here, uh, our current rulers don't believe in God, but they do believe in the devil. <laughs> All right. And and their belief in the devil is why they want to as- ascend the sides of the north. They want to be be as the Most High. That was the initial temptation in the garden. You shall be as God. Yes. O- okay. So. Our, our current rulers are are very ambitious, and they want to aspire to that height. Uh, we don't want to resist them in the name of Christ, because we don't want to launch another series of interminable religious wars. Right. Okay. Uh, we because we don't want the Muslims fighting with the Jews, fighting with the Christians, fighting with you know all of that. All right. So that's that's the most reasonable question when they say which God. The Christian, and here's the answer to your question. The Christian na- nationalist is the one who's willing to answer that question and speaking in, in, into the microphone. The true God, the living God, the one who exists. Yes. N- not the one, not the God on our money. All law, and this is the next um, principle, all law is imposed morality. By right? definition. By definition. It's not whether, but which. It's not, it's not whether you're imposing morality, it's which morality you're imposing. The late Francis Schaeffer was really good at spelling this out. We, we want form and freedom together. So the, when, when we say Christian nationalism, there are only three ways of basic ways of organizing human society. There's tribalism, there's nationalism, and then there's globalism. I don't want globalism. I don't want to eat bugs. I don't want tribalism because nobody wants to live in a failed state, Somalia, with warlords. Nobody, no, nobody wants to live in Thunderdome. So I don't want tribalism, and I don't want globalism. And we have a national structure now. So as a Christian, I would like that national structure to conform to the things that God wants and not the things that man wants. That's Christian nationalism. So. But may I ask, um, of course, I, I, yes. I agree vehemently with everything you've said. Let me pose the maybe two problems that people might have hearing the phrase Christian nationalism. The first and most obvious is, well, what if I'm not Christian? Right. How do I fit into that? All right. The, you would probably, you would fit in better than you're fitting in now. 
um, one of the things that a non-believer, uh, basically, I, I trust the Christians. This I'm speaking historically. I, I trust the Christians to take better care of a secularist's liberty than I trust the secularists to take care of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely put. <laughs> okay, I think we're. I think we're. Uh, you have the last two thousand years to to back you up on that. Correct, and that's not to say that there weren't warts and sins and blemishes in Christian history. There really, there really were. But you take the worst. You know, th take the worst of the worst in Christian history. Something like the Spanish Inquisition. Right. Okay. Some terrible, terrible thing, um, which I'm not carrying water for at all. Terrible thing. The Spanish Inquisition killed a few thousand people over a few centuries. That was Stalin on a slow afternoon. Yes. Okay. The, the commies have killed 100 million people in the last century or so. All right. Um, uh, tens of millions of people. And, and yet they go on serenely as though their copybook is not blotted and ours is. So Christian nationalism does not imply forced conversion. It does not. Or a reduction in the rights of non-Christians. No, it's an expansion of the rights of non-Christians. Can, can you give me an example of the liberties non-Christians would gain well, under such a structure? How, how many of our chains have we gotten used to? Right. Um, too many. Too many. So the, one of the common things that the people who are trying to scare people with Christian nationalism, trying to spook us with that sort of thing and they say we need to keep the government out of our bedrooms well i had the privilege a number of years ago building my own house and i know exactly how many sc screws the government required to be in the sheetrock in my bedroom how big the windows had to be for yes. egress in my bedroom how thick the sheetrock had to be in my bedroom the, uh what do you mean keep the government out of my bedroom i can't remove the mattress tag from the uh, from <laughs> the mattress because the government is in my bedroom <laughs> literally right but why what about Christianity would inspire you to offer more liberty as opposed to like your dedication to Hayek. Okay. Like, but yeah. why Christianity? Uh, I only want to allow coercion, which is what this, the magistrate does. I only want to allow coercion if there is black letter biblical justification for it. It's sort of like a, I don't have a problem prosecuting rapists. Because I can show you in the Bible where that should be done. I don't have a problem prosecuting murderers because I can show you in the Bible that this is something that God entrusted to the the magistrate to do to to keep order by punishing rape and and murder and that yes. and so on. Um, I don't. I can't find anything in the Bible that allows the government to dictate the temperature of the water that comes out of the shower head in my bathroom. Consequently, the government has no business doing that. It's none of their business. They have no authorization. And you look at the um, Ten Commandments. It fits, you could fit the Ten Commandments on a postcard. And then you could fit the Old Testament in one volume on the shelf. Go to the local library and ask to look at the, the code for your state. Shelf after shelf. Right? The Federal Register of Laws. Shelf after shelf after shelf. All right. That, that kind of tyranny... All right. Somebody has a website, I think, called Three Felonies a Day. The average American is guilty of trespassing. They can always get used for something. Of course. Right. Because they've got so many rules that you're always transgressing. Um, and then when they decide to pull the switch, they can just come scoop you up and take you off. Right. And make it happen. Uh, in a, in a biblical law order, you have Ten Commandments and then you have the commentary on those Ten Commandments, which would be the rest of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And if it's not there, right, if, if, um, if someone says, oh, we need to prosecute this guy for hate crimes, as a, and I say, oh, as opposed to the normal, ordinary love crimes, <laughs> what, what, are you, what are you talking about? Why, why are you punishing him for an attitude? You have, no, you have no authorization. You can get him for taking the guy's bicycle or smashing in his windows. You've got authorization biblically to punish the wrongdoer. That's Romans 13, that God gives the sword to the magistrate to reward the righteous and punish the wrongdoer. But then the Bible defines what is that wrongdoing. And certain things are, uh, people think that if it's in the Bible, it we can enforce it. Well, no, in the Bible, there's a difference between sins and crimes. A crime is something that the Bible identifies as evil, and there's a civil penalty attached. But in the Ten Commandments, the Tenth Commandment, covetousness, there's there's no penalty attached. We, I don't want covetousness police. I don't want lust police. I don't want 
there's there's no penalty attached. I have no authorization to arrest someone for looking long, longingly through a catalog too long. Well, that's for sure. And what, and what you're describing is a country that, as it has become less Christian, has become more authoritarian. Correct. So I, and, and that's obvious and demonstrable. But for saying what you just said, you will be, and have already been, by Russell Moore most recently in Christianity Today, described as a theocrat. And what you just described will be called theocracy. Right. How is what you just described different from theocracy? The Here's the difference between, this is what they're, they're thinking of. When they think of theocracy, they're thinking of ecclesiocracy, right? They're, they're ruled thinking, by priests. Ruled by clerics, ruled by priests, okay? And they're thinking of something like Iran right. with a bunch of reformed weird beards issuing dict- <laughs> weird beards, <laughs> you know, yes. they're doing their thing. And they, they're thinking of a cabal of uh, clerics and holy men and shamans and whatever. Uh, issuing decrees on the basis of a religion that the populace doesn't accept. And then, and we just jam it down their throats. Well, we don't jam things down people's throats. That's what they do. That's what they're doing now. Sure. California passed a referendum restricting marriage to a man and a woman, and it was right. overturned. So, right. so much for democracy. Right. So um, w- we are not wanting, on the basis of some clerical decision, have the clerics rule and decide like in Iran, only a Christian. We don't want the Christian Ayatollahs. Christians invented the doctrine of separation of church and state. That's our doctrine. That's, that is something that came from us. We're the ones who developed it. And separation of church and state is crucial because there are two governing institutions. The church governs men in a certain sphere, and the state governs men in a certain sphere. Because they're both forms of government, you can keep them separate. But what, when, when people say separation of church and state, and they mean separation of God and state, separation of morality and state, separation of ultimate truth claims and state, I would say, stop, wait, wait, just a minute. Are you really telling me that you want to live in a state that is utterly disconnected from morality? Is that what you want? Where the you, you protest and and your protest is a moral one, uh, and they say, "Well, we we believe in the separation of morality and state." It's, but but as you noted at the outset, that's that's a nonsensical proposition that I, that has never existed and can't exist. I, I know because all moralities arise out of a moral consensus, of course. Okay, which is um, overwhelmingly religious. So consequently, you can separate church and state, but you can't separate ultimate truth claims and state. That cannot be done. Every people needs to know who they are. They need to know what they are. They need to know where they came from. They need to know how we're supposed to behave on the way. Those are basic theological I don't think issues. any honest, rational person would disagree with what you just said, that all laws are judgments about how people right. should live, and they're moral judgments, and that there's going to be a system for deciding what's right and wrong, because there always is, and it's going to be, if it's Marxism or Christianity, one's clearly superior. The question, though, is... How do you affect or bring back such a system in a country that has no working majority of anything? Yeah. So when you have a cacophony of um, laws, it reflects the cacophony of op- <laughs> a, a cacophony of opinions among the people, and and this is where unbridled immigration comes into the picture. You you can't just import floods and floods of people with different assumptions about everything into one spot and say, play nice, children. Um, societies have to function on the basis of a shared moral consensus. Exactly. Okay? If there isn't a shared moral consensus, then you're, what you're going to get is anarchy and disruption and conflict. Wait a second. I have read um, many Episcopal bishops and Russell Moore, not to beat upon poor Russell Moore, who's living in agony already, but um, say, make the claim that it is anti-Christian if you don't let anyone who wants to move to your society move here. Right. That's like saying to a godly, sweet Christian couple who has three foster children, and they're taking good care. They have four kids of their own. They've taken in three foster children, and they're taking good care of them. And then you show up one day with a short bus with 28 new foster children, and you say, we're depositing them here. And we wait, wait, the couple says, we didn't sign up for that many. What kind of a non-Christian attitude is that? refusing to take these 28 new foster children. The the dad, who was taking care good care of three foster children, 
is should be able to say, look, I'm taking care of three, and I think I'm take, doing a good job taking care of three. But if you drop off 28 more, I'm not going to be taking good care of anybody. It's going to swamp the system, right? You, you can't say uh, we need to kick the doors open wide in the name of hospitality without the capacity to process them. You have to assimilate them, right? And it's got to be orderly. So if people say, do I object to immigration? Of course not. I object to anarchy. <laughs> I object to chaos. Uh, so I object to the lawlessness that's operating on the southern border. Uh, orderly immigration, uh, all about uh, all about that. Uh, and that would be wonderful. So I, I'm sorry, I've sidetracked you. I, I had to ask you that. Yeah. But, um, but you were in the process before I interrupted you of answering the question, how do you go back to a system based on Christian assumptions in a country that's no longer Christian? There is no political solution. The next election, however happy it might make us for 10 minutes, is not going to fix everything. That's right. Okay. Uh, our disease is radical and it's spiritual. Uh, we've, we've got a, we've got a radical leprosy and uh, the United States needs to repent uh, of its sin, to use an old-fashioned term. We need to repent of our sins, our arrogance, and turn back to God. We, that's, what, that's what is necessary, and we need preachers who are willing to tell them to do that. America needs Jesus. America doesn't need it to turn over a new leaf. America needs a new life. In, in throughout the Old Testament, maybe even in the New Nations are punished for their sins, not yeah. just individuals, but nations. Co corporate, right? The nation. Um, does that still happen? Do you believe? And second, you've made reference a couple of times to America's America, not just Americans, but America as a nation, mm -hmm. its need to repent of its sins. What sins? Okay. So, yes, God still judges. Nations. Right. Nations. Uh, God still judges. God is, uh, God is the sovereign of all the earth. He still does right. He, uh, wickedness still offends him. So I believe that if our nation were destroyed for our arrogance and conceit by fireballs from heaven, uh, you know, if, if God were to do that, uh, it would be not unjust. It would be a just judgment. We, we have been arrogant in the extreme. And I would say the central arrogance there's, there's fruits of this arrogance downstream, the 60 million children who were aborted, the, the various things that we do, um, the going around the world, preaching at people, how to get their life together. Threatening them, killing them. When we don't know how to live our lives. <coughs> All of that. That's the fruit of the central sin. The central sin is secularism. The grand secular experiment is now at a point where they don't know what a girl is. That's because secularism is not a biologist, right? It, they can't tell you what a girl is. They can't tell you what a human being is. And if, you, if they can't tell you what a human being is, how can they tell you what human rights are? Well, they, they can't. And, they, and more, more than that, they don't want to because, because they want to move us around as though we are just uh, pieces on the board that they, you know, to, to, to gratify their whims and their theories. So secularism is the idea that we can establish agnosticism or atheism as the official faith of the country and govern ourselves decently without reference to God. That is radically false. We can't do it. Has we, it ever been achieved anywhere in no, history that you're aware of? No. When godless types are running the show and they are making all the decisions and they don't answer to God at all, the countries that they rule are always hellholes. Always. If I'm in charge, if I have political power, if I'm Mao, and I know that power grows out of the barrel of a gun, and there, I, there's no one above me that I'm ever going to answer to, if that's my framework, I have absolutely no reason not to do whatever I please. That's right. there, there's no accountability. And that's what secularism leads to. That's, it leads to, of necessity. And this is why in the old order, in the, uh, uh, in the Christian order, it used to be laws against taking testimony in court from people who wouldn't take an oath in the name of God. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't testify in court if you didn't believe in a final judgment. Because there'd be no constraint on your lying. Yeah, no reason to not lie. So, what, you know, it's possible that you've got very far out threatening views, but um, that you haven't expressed yet, but and I'll ask you if you do. Right, yeah. But, oh, no, everything's... I'm, I'm in the middle of the road. Ex extremists are to my right and left. Well, <laughs> you are kind of in the middle of the road, at least in what you've said so far. Uh -huh. From a Christian perspective, you're not 
you don't want to convert anyone by force. You want no. people to have more freedom to make their own decisions about what they believe right. Right. and how they want to live. Um, you're against arrogance and hurting people. I mean, these are not crazy views. So why are you so hated by so well, obviously by the left, but also by a lot of Christian leaders don't like you and are always attacking you. What is that? Well, some uh, the left hates what I'm talking about, I think, because I'm about to touch the thing with a needle. I'm about to I'm, I'm going for the sore spot. The, the sore spot is this sec this radical disease of secularism. They, they want to continue to govern their affairs without any kind of accountability. Yes. Okay. They want they want to be left alone as they are running the show. And they will give the treatment to anybody who crosses them. All right? I, you've gotten the treatment before. I get the treatment. You, they, they know how to rough somebody up. Okay? And there are Christians who distance themselves from me because they see that. All right? But, right. But if they're, if they're self-described Christians, again, I don't want to use his name once again, but the guy who edits Christianity Today is fixated on you. Uh, David French is in your mm -hmm. Times columnist who calls himself a Christian, and they really go out of their way to attack you. Why? Well, um, basically, your theology doesn't sound so different from like kind of conventional Christian theology, as I understand it. Right. Uh, here's the. This is the. I think the distinction. I mean it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's, there's that. Okay, uh, when, uh, we ought to acknowledge God, and I mean that we really should, right? So there's a difference between that and wanting a place at the table. That takes us back to the earlier point. To confess that Jesus is Lord is to confess that Caesar isn't, right? That's the issue. Going back to the early Christians would not worship Caesar, and I'm not going to worship the state. Right? If, the, if there is no God over the state, the state becomes God, and they proclaim themselves God, I'm going to be like Nebuchadnezzar, uh, like Daniel's three friends, who refused to bow Shadrach down. Shadrach. And... I've got a grandson named Shadrach. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, um, we want to pass that legacy on, that, um, refusing to bow down. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to the king, our God is able to deliver us, but whether he does or not, we fear him and not you. And that's the thing, that's the challenge that the secular state cannot abide. Uh, another th great so Thomas Sowell quote, I'll paraphrase it, he said, it's amazing how much panic can be thrown among uh, people by the behavior of one honest man. That's true. <laughs> right? One honest man can throw people into a state of consternation and panic um, <laughs> because you're willing to say, look, this is the way it is. We need to <laughs> love God, hate sin. That's, that's, boy, that is the truest thing. Um, so, I mean, what do you think, and this is my last question, like, what is going on <laughs> in the world? It, it, and I know that everybody famously feels like they're in the middle of some historical reset and it's the fall of Rome or the end of times or whatever, but this doesn't feel like a normal moment. No, it's not a normal moment. Um, the, one of the reasons this is a sort of a practical, pragmatic, almost carnal observation, but I'm hopeful because in the long run, stupidity never works. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, you, can, you can proclaim all you want, but you can't make the world be a different, you have to live in the world God actually made. You don't, you don't get to live in the world of your own imagining. You have to live in the world that God made, not the world that you want to make. And consequently, you have to obey its rules. Yes. Right? I used to call this natural law. Yeah. Uh, I saw a great t-shirt once. Gravity. It's not just a good idea. <laughs> it's, it's the law. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, so, so, um, so with all this, um, I'm hopeful because I believe the promises of Psalms, the promises of Isaiah, the promises of um, uh, given to Abraham, through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I believe that God's plans for this world are for good, not evil. I believe that God sent his son to be the savior of the world, not to, uh, not to attempt to save the world. He, Jesus didn't come to give saving the world the old college try. Um, the um, the f most famous verse in the Bible, John three sixteen, is followed by God did not three seventeen. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Now that I know what a Christian nationalist is, well, maybe I am, and I think you know what that's what I've seen Africa doing the whole time too. We know that we have a God that's above any man will ever come to this earth. 
because Jesus has already been here. He came and he went. He died and he rose, and he is our Savior. So now I think that Africa is saying, oh, you want to bring this all this nonsense to us? Do you want to bring this insanity to our nation? No. No. We believe that there is a God above the government. I hope that this enlightened everybody, gives them a little bit of an idea of what's going on out there. Know that if God is for us, who can be against us? Well, the United States government for one. <laughs> but you know what? They're just a little itty bitty ant, a little speck of dirt in the whole ocean compared to my God. So, so be ye not moved, ladies and gentlemen. Be encouraged right now that your God is able to do a far more above what you could ask or hope for. You know what? So we're just going to continue uh, loving on one another, encouraging one another. And I want to say I want to thank you all for watching. And we'll see you on the next one. God bless. One love.